Once again, I'm joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. And Andrew, nothing is over till we say nothing it is. Nothing is over till we say it. It's Walker. over. Walker. <laughs> but this is the last episode. Uh, <laughs> Sad to report. A <laughs> little somber tonight. Uh, all good stories must come to an end. And yep. uh, this is our final episode of Hollywood Crime Scene. Uh, our reasons are that we, we really kind of hit on everything we could possibly come up with within this vein. Uh, we've told a lot of great stories over the past, uh, year and a half or so. For sure. Uh, exploring, uh, the seedy side of Hollywood, the unsolved mysteries and murders and scandals. And, uh, over the past few months, it's like, okay, what's our next episode going to be? And we would sit there scratching our heads, trying to come up with our next episode. And I, I came to the conclusion that, okay, maybe this has run its course. Uh, every episode is out there for anyone who wants to go back and find them and listen to them. I think they're pretty darn entertaining. Mm-hmm. I we didn't get to the biased. bottom of the chili pie. You never want to get to the bottom of the chili pie <laughs> just right. before, just so that there's one good layer. And then you're like, okay, it's like Seinfeld. You, you go out while you're on top. Right. Right. Uh, we produced 28 episodes. <clears throat> we premiered, in uh, July of 2022 uh, with our first episode, which coincidentally uh, was our most popular episode on YouTube with over 200 views on YouTube. Thank and you for listening. The, the story that inspired this whole podcast is the one that we tackled on that first episode, the murder of uh, film producer and director William Desmond Taylor. Uh, we also talked about uh, Thelma Todd and her mysterious uh, possible murder where she was found in a garage right. with blood, but they said it might have been uh, asphyxiation from, I don't know. Um, and then, ironically, I kind of found out after we had done that podcast that that garage, that structure still exists, and you can oh. visit that location if you wanted to. So that's something next time I get out to Hollywood, I want to visit some of the locations that uh, we've talked about over the course of this podcast, like uh, the home where Bugsy Malone yeah. uh, was uh, gunned down. Uh, as a matter of fact, again, this is, you know, this whole podcast, that all kinds of weird coincidences and stuff would, would surface and uh, kind of a, a a a online friend of mine, Alison Martino out there in Hollywood, who works to preserve the history of Hollywood. Not too long after we did a podcast talking about Bugsy Bugsy Malone, uh, she visited the house and like went inside the house and I guess it was up for sale. And so she, she made arrangements to go in there and get a tour of the home and got to see where Bugsy was sitting and which window the uh, shots came through. Oh, no, that's pretty cool. I would love to get an opportunity to visit some of those locations that we've talked about. And as they come to mind, maybe we'll mention some of those. Um, So, yeah, it all started uh, July 2022. We went 28 episodes. Uh, This episode would be episode 29, obviously. Uh, so, guys, you know, it was what a are, different world back then. <laughs> a year and a half ago, we were emerging from COVID, you know, and, you know, the, this whole podcast came about when the three of us were sitting in the lobby here one day waiting on some people to arrive. And we just started talking about some of these unsolved Hollywood murders. And Nick, I think it was you who said, you know, what? this might make a good podcast. And yeah, because it was fascinating. The ultra detail is I walked in because I was late for something, as usual, and I saw mm-hmm. Joe and Andrew on the couch, and they were talking, and they had these stories going on, and, and Joe is like this repository of <laughs> L.A. knowledge. Like, I don't need any tours. If we ever get to go to L.A., I'm taking Joe with me. Yes, yes. Like, Joe, what's the story behind this building and here? And, you know, who was murdered here? The cops might be wanting to talk to you. <laughs> now when I think about this. Yeah, if I'm showing up at all these crime scenes. Uh, let's kind of go over. So that was the first episode was the William Desmond Taylor, Thelma Todd. Oh, speaking of William Desmond Taylor, here's another weird coincidence. So I, I'm, I'm a fan of movies about Hollywood and, and Hollywood loves movies about Hollywood. 
And I'd stumbled Hail on. Caesar. Uh, yeah, exactly. Hollywood land. Uh, yeah, all that stuff. The player, you know, that yeah. sort of stuff. Once upon a time in Hollywood. Um, and so that and I, my love of noir films led me to discover a movie called Hollywood Story, which was re- released in 1951, starred Richard Conti and Julie Adams, who most people would uh, remember from Creature from the Black Lagoon. She was the love interest in that movie. Uh, and an appearance by Jim Backus, who was Thurston Howell III on Gilligan's Island. And uh, as I'm watching this movie, I'm quickly realizing that it's about, without mentioning names, it was about the William Desmond Taylor murder. And I had always said, and I may have said on our podcast, that that would be a great topic for a movie. Yep. Mm-hmm. And what this Hollywood story did was uh, a guy wants to make a movie, and he decides he wants to write a movie about the unsolved murder of this uh, kind of fictional director-producer, which was based heavily on William Desmond Taylor. And then there are uh, people trying to silence him as he's digging about the murder. And I'm like, wow, that is right up my alley. And it was cool to discover that film after we did our deep dive into uh, William Desmond Taylor. So check out Hollywood story. If you get a chance, um, guys, uh, before I kind of go down the list, is there anything that jumps out at you as some favorite moments or things you discovered or, or maybe, you know, what were some celebrity tragedies or deaths that hit you hardest? Are there any names where when you learned about the murder of someone or saw it on the news of a, of a questionable death, are there any that was like a gut punch to you? For me, I really, when I got into Marilyn Monroe and the Black Dahlia, like there are certain deaths that stand out, like Black Dahlia, Marilyn Monroe, like, you know the surface stuff, but when we did a deeper dive into some of those stories, that was the one where I went, "Oh my god!" There was yeah. how how did this how did this go? And no one really, you know, picked at some of these stuff. Some of the stuff that we were talking about uh, on the Desmond Bryan things, like, "Yeah, it's a it's a robbery. It's a robbery. Are you sure about this?" Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or remember, they, originally they thought he died of natural oh, causes. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, natural causes. Like yeah. he had lead poisoning. <laughs> and then, and then, they, then they rolled him over and, and yeah. he had a bullet yeah. in the back. Yeah, and that changed forensics forever. Next time, <laughs> let's roll the body over before we draw any conclusions. You know, it was wild because our first, I want to say a dozen episodes, we just kept going over these cases where you look at the LA, LAPD and like, what are you guys doing here? Ah, we just need to get these cases rolling. I think right around that time, Perry Mason on HBO Max came out, and it yeah. kind of highlighted the the way the LAPD kind of operated. They kind of touched on it, yeah. saying, yeah, hey, look, you know, it's an open-shut case. You know, yeah. well, Why are you wasting time on this? I think the most intriguing stories that we touched on are, are, of course, the unsolved ones because it leads to all kinds of speculation and theories, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Like with Marilyn Monroe, was, was the Kennedy involved? Was the mob involved? Uh, who was behind it, you know? And Or was it just an accidental overdose? Uh, my Black fa- Dahlia, yeah, unsolved. Who was it? Who was behind it? So. My favorite episode was the Hollywood Fixers, Eddie Maddox and company. Oh yeah, what yeah. They, like when the studio said, "Hey, she's pregnant. No, she's gonna get, give birth to <laughs> and adopt her own baby." Yeah, yeah. And the way they would just go about, like, nope, I guess you can't cause a problem. You're out. You're out. And they would do anything. Isn't it crazy to think that there was a, a period in Hollywood history when something tragic would happen? They would call the studios first before the, before the cops, and yeah. then the cops would come and find this crime scene where things were conveniently missing. And They're handing the cops reports like, this is what happened. <laughs> this sure, is what, yeah. yeah, let's file this away. That blows my mind that that was a thing, and it makes you wonder if anything like that is still happening today, like Absolutely. The, the cover-ups. You know? we, 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 we could draw a direct line from that all the way to... Uh, uh, Harvey, yeah, because yeah. no one, everyone knew it. No one wanted to say it. Mm-hmm. Everyone, it was the kind of that unspoken where you kind of oh, see right. Seth MacFarlane making jokes of it when he's the MC of a award show. Hey, I guess we're all on like Harvey Fine, right? Right, Harvey? Yeah, yeah. Wink. <laughs> and everyone like shifts in their seats yeah, uncomfortably. And, uh, but in the in the TV, I was like, what was that about? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I think it absolutely does happen. Ah, oh, that's crazy. Andrew, what about you? Anything jump out uh, over this past I, year and the half? Which ones did you take personally? You know. I also was going to say Marilyn because I didn't know like to the full extent with which she was involved with other people. Like I didn't know with Sinatra with she was involved with Sinatra. Of course I knew about the Kennedy thing. Yeah. And then of course 
I know you said you didn't watch that movie Blonde, right, Joe? Because you, you, you no, didn't, I, I didn't have see it sully those. your your view of. Well, I'd rather watch a documentary than someone to try to interpret what had happened. So right. I I watched that when it came out when we were talking about this, and I I really liked the movie. I thought it was really well made. Very speculum. Uh, well, okay. Well, we yeah, <laughs> the POV. Yeah, but I mean, besides but besides that, <laughs> besides that, um. It, I, it was just like a fresh take on it and um, not necessarily flattering, but it was, it was something new. And, yeah. and uh, to me, that was, that was interesting. But no, and Anna DeMarmus was, is, should get an Oscar nomination for that. Yeah. The, the problems with uh, the problem with movies that try to depict real life icons is you can never find an actor that can fully capture what that star possessed even like the fairly recent elvis movie i just never quite felt like he captured what the qualities that elvis that made elvis elvis and same thing with marilyn no matter what actress you cast on that role she it's just you're never gonna it's you know i want to sit there with my arms folded and go you're not marilyn i know marilyn (laughs) you're no marilyn um it's hard to capture that essence that made these people what they are. And so these fictional accounts are always tough for me to watch just because I feel like they, they don't do the, the subject justice. You know, you know, I mean, they just did it for, uh, what what's his face? Um, uh, <coughs> Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix. The bio, uh, the, isn't, isn't the biography coming out? The, oh, I heard about that. Who's playing them? I forgot, but, you know, so, because who yeah. wants to step into these roles? Because you know right. it's coming. I mean, Michael's is coming. Someone's going to do Michael. <laughs> well, I think one of the best movie depictions of a real life legend was the Doors movie with uh, Val Kilmer. Yes. Uh, even though the movie's a little long, they could have probably cut an hour out of it. Um, Val Kilmer's portrayal of of Jim Morrison was incredible to the point where members of the Doors couldn't tell where they were using Jim Morrison tracks and where Val Kilmer was singing. The band couldn't tell them apart. Wow. Uh, so in my opinion, that was one of the greatest portrayals of a, a tragic legend. Um, that was pretty incredible. You yeah. got to tip your hat to some of the actors because they know what they're stepping into. Yeah. You want me to play Marilyn in the biopic? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Boy. Yeah. Now, for me personally, uh, episode three, uh, we we kind of did a behind the laughter episode and talked about the connection between tragedy and comedy. Oh, yeah. And for me personally, anytime we lost a comedian, uh, you know, to, to sinister uh, accounts or whatever, uh, that always hit me hard. Uh, Phil Hartman. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, those those legends of SNL, Chris Farley. Um, and, you know, more recently, you know, we lost Pee Wee Herman. Not that it was necessarily uh, sinister. He, he died of cancer. Um, Robin but, Williams. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that one, that one, was that would fall on. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, anytime we lost a, a funny person, that always seemed to hit me hard because I love comedy. I love comedy. I like I said, I, I've seen more comedians live on stage than bands. Uh, I love comedy, and so when you know you hear the breaking news or you get the notification on your phone now that says so-and-so passed away. It, to me, that always is a gut punch for me when we lose these funny people. And it seemed like, gosh, over the past year or so, we lost a bunch, like back to back to back to back. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, what's his name? I was just talking about him from Full House. Um, Bob Saget. Uh, Bob yeah, Saget and Norm MacDonald. Like, yeah. we yeah. lost a bunch of them in a row. Uh, uh, what's his name? Affleck. What's his name? Uh Oh, uh, Gilbert, Gilbert Gilbert Gottfried, Gilbert, Gilbert Gottfried, like we, Matthew Perry, we lost a bunch, yeah, a bunch of funny people, and it's, I'm dreading. It's the, I know one. it's coming. I'm dreading the time when I see Mel Brooks. He's uh, ninety something. Oh nice. yeah, Carl Reiner first went, and then I'm like, oh boy. Yeah, that was yeah. that was pretty recent. Right? Carl Car- Reiner. Carl Carl Reiner was I think two years ago, maybe. Yeah, yeah, and he was very active on Twitter. Yeah, uh, I was following him on Twitter, and he had very poignant posts, and he was very active politically, and. It's weird to say, wow, Carl Reiner is posting on Twitter, and then those posts stop. I mean, it, it's selfish me. I want another decade of, of, of Mel Brooks, yeah. minimum. Yeah. You know, I, I have a feeling uh, Mel Brooks has probably wrote his own uh, epitaph. I could see when the day that Mel Brooks passes away at 90-something years old. You said, he, is he closing in on 100? Uh, I think he's 91 or 92. 91. 
I can see Mel Brooks' closest family and friends going, he was taken too soon. And <laughs> honestly, I would agree with that because yeah. any time is too soon with Mel Brooks. I just and- want him to beat Kissinger. <laughs> That's right. Get past Kissinger. Yeah. Kissinger yeah. got 100. Yeah. Mel Brooks deserves two. They, they, <laughs> they say only the good die young, but uh, Kissinger was, uh, yeah, he lasted a long time. Um, so, yeah, for me personally, uh, co- the Comedians episode was, was a tough one. Yeah. Uh, the second episode that we did uh, was uh, the curse, uh, Rebel Without a Cause curse. I think we touched on some oh, other yeah. movie curses, too. Uh, that one was a, kind of a fun one to talk about. Um, you know, sometimes you can sort of cherry pick facts and say, oh, there's there's a curse on the set of Rebel Without a Cause. Um, but really, when you look at that movie, uh, you know, f- the four leads in that movie all had tragic ends. And you got to wonder what what's going on there. Not that they all, you know, well, I guess for the most part, they all died relatively young. But yeah, so that was episode two. Three was Comedians. Uh, four was a fun one. Mob hits. Oh boy! Uh, when we talked about uh, Bugsy Malone and uh, well, what was the other guy's name that ran Hollywood uh, back then and uh, and there took were, control of the unions. There and was all a Stampinato in there somewhere. Stampinato, yeah, yeah. The, uh, <laughs> I mean, it was yeah. basically the, the history of Vegas. How Vegas just came from the the, the mob was like, yeah, let's build it over here in the in, in the sand. Yeah, and they get their hands uh, in in where the money is. So. Uh, after mob hits, uh, let's see. Oh, musicians, basically the day the music died. Uh, we talked about Buddy Holly and, and uh, a lot of musicians who met tragic ends. Uh, this was, a, I think this was your idea. The Hollywood blacklist. Uh, that was a fun one. I learned some new things on that. Um, that was really, really interesting. Uh, here's another one of my favorites that we did. Uh, blonde bombshells. Yeah. We did. Uh, where we focused on Marilyn and and uh, a lot of the platinum blondes in Hollywood that met tragic. Oh, ends. you know which uh, remind me which another one that stood out Sh- the Sharon Tate one. Sharon oh, Tate, yeah. yep, yeah, that was that was a the big details. One. Of the, uh, I never yeah. got the details of that of that case other than the when we did that episode. I went, oh my god. Well, we did our deep dive on that uh, a few episodes later when we focused on cults and specifically mm-hmm. the Manson family murders and. Um, the alternate take that Quentin Tarantino did with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, but yeah, that's that's one that's I think still haunts Hollywood today. Um, every time I see Sharon pop up in something, whether it's uh, uh, the Dean Martin, uh, James Bond spoof, or uh, Beverly Hillbillies, it's so tragic any time I see a picture. She was so beautiful and so young and had so much promise uh, that just got taken away. Uh, after Blonde Bombshells, uh, Haunted Hollywood, that was fun. Oh, we, yeah. That was our, we tied that in with ho- uh, Halloween in 2022. Uh, that was a good time uh, looking at the different haunted locations, including the studios, stories of hauntings at the studios. Uh, let's see. Oh, we, and we, then- we had a Pixar string there, didn't we? we? We had like hit after hit of episode, like just interesting episode. Topics. Yeah, everyone felt like better than the one before. Mm-hmm. Uh, after our Halloween one, the election, uh, was rolling around in 2022. So we did a a political episode, uh, which was really interesting. And we went down some rabbit holes on that one. Let it never be said that we do not have our fingers on the pulse of the people. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Uh, then we did cults and then, uh, child stars, which is always a popular topic. Um, so many child stars just went down the wrong path. It seemed like it was it was the norm, not the exception. The exception were child stars who escaped that. Remember what happened to Alfalfa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shot geez. in the groin I'm hoping area. it just. I am hoping for a different scenario for our 21st century, like Selena Gomez, <laughs> right? You know, right. And, and, you know, Ariana Grande. I'm hoping that it works out better for them. Yeah, um, you know who's I've been seeing a lot on social media lately. The entire cast of uh, a Christmas story have been making the rounds, uh, signing autographs and stuff like that. And I've seen several people post pictures with Peter Billingsley. And here's a child star who was in TV commercials as Messy Marvin. And then, you know, obviously his claim to fame is a Christmas story, but he went on to become a, a successful writer and director. And 
and then recently reappeared in the sequel to A Christmas Story. Did, did and, you yeah. end up seeing that? I did, and I actually really enjoyed I it. I didn't hear anything about it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I was it, scared. Yeah. I was scared to watch it. I'll admit I'm a coward. I, I, I can't because I got it. It's Christmas right now. I yeah. can't jeopardize that. I, I love Christmas Story so much. I'm scared that the sequel will just. I recommend it. Uh, if you're looking for something to watch uh, okay. as Christmas uh, comes around, uh, I recommend it. There, there are enough. some cringeworthy moments in the movie, but overall, I'm like, okay, that was a worthy sequel. They, they respected the source material. So, so yeah, child star is always a, a, a hot topic. Uh, we follow that up with onset accidents, uh, uh, tragedies like The Crow. Yep. And uh, accidents that happened on set. The Twilight Zone movie. Twilight Zone. That was a big one. Yeah. Uh, then we did crime in film. I'm trying to remember. Oh, they were real life crimes depicted in film was the theme of that one. Uh, so that one was really interesting. Uh, another fun one, Femme Fatales. Uh, oh, yeah. In doing research for that one, I found out that uh, murdering women was sort of Hollywood fiction, that there's not a, a lot of real-life stories that involve women committing murders and, and crimes. I mean, obviously it happens, but uh, the idea that we have in our heads of femme fatales was pretty much uh, created by Hollywood. Yeah. You know, their, their, <laughs> their hatred of women, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, but, uh, but that, was, that was an interesting one. And again, learned some new stuff. Uh, we follow that one up in April of uh, 2020. Oh, wait, am I jumping ahead? No. April 2023, we did uh, Racism in Hollywood. That one was a, a, a really good one. One of my favorites. When, I thought. when we had Mark on. Yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. And Yeah, that was one of our few guests, man. Yeah. I wish we would have done that more often. I wish we would have brought more guests on. We intimidate people. <laughs> I guess. They can't keep up with us. Hey, we can, we can next year. Yeah, there Plan you go. For it. Yeah. There you go. Uh, we follow that up with uh, Hollywood is Burning, uh, where uh, fires that sort of change Hollywood, and, and every single uh, movie studio in Hollywood had been affected by arson and fires. Treasure troves uh, of footage that is gone that we'll never know about. Yeah, and uh, sets and facades that were burned down. You know, that famous courthouse square where Back to the Future and Gremlins was filmed. The only original remaining structure is the clock tower everything else has been lost in Jeez. fires and rebuilt wow. uh so that was that was a tragic one uh the next one unions uh, and union busting that one was that was an interesting one and uh yeah walt disney loved the unions didn't he yeah <laughs> now i'm trying to think and andrew will find hoffa did the <laughs> did the writers strike and sag strike take place after we did that podcast because or was our podcast inspired by those strikes? I think that started in, was it May? Yeah. Those strikes, and then when did that come out? May. So, uh, oh, I'm sure. Yeah. So, yeah, we must have been inspired by real-life uh, stories. Be because but, yeah. if they hadn't gone on strike by then, they were at least talking about yeah. it. Like, it was right. it was definitely the, looming. Yeah, yeah and, and the thing right. that— The writers went on May, the actors went in June. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The thing that concerns me now is, is the repercussions of those strikes. I mean, I support— what the the actors and the writers, of course, but uh, what I'm concerned about is 2024. Like, what impact was was that lengthy strike going to have on uh, films being released in 2024? Um, 2023, I feel, was a really weak year for films. We'll get more into that later. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering if 2024 is going to be even worse um, because of those strikes. Maybe it'll be uh, a, a good time for for some uh, indie films to shine. Yeah. Yeah. Instead exactly. Of just always Disney and. Yeah, yeah, I would love to be surprised with something uh, unexpected yeah. instead of all these sequels and prequels and reboots and remakes. Yep. Uh, we followed Unions with Hollywood at War, and uh, that one was a really uh, interesting yep. one. Uh, people who died at war or because of war or who had served, um, which brings up something. You know, I was going to ask you guys, was there something you feel we had left out or we overlooked? And... A couple of weeks ago, a name jumped out at me, and I'm thinking, I was mad at myself for not talking about this um, because it falls in that either Hollywood at War category or a recent one that we did, the uh, the plane crashes. Um, but I found 
a movie that I've been wanting to get. I haven't watched it yet, but I, I just bought it on DVD. Uh, it's called To Hell and Back. Okay. And uh, it was a 1955 movie uh, starring Audie Murphy. And the movie is based on a book that Audie Murphy wrote about his experiences at war. So he's basically playing himself in the movie. Uh, so he was an American soldier, actor, and even songwriter. Uh, he was one of the most decorated American combat soldiers of World War II, received every military combat award for valor available from the U.S. Army, received awards from the French and uh, Belgian Award for Heroism. heroism. Uh, he received the Medal of Honor for Valor that he demonstrated at the age of 19. He lied about his age to uh, serve uh, in the Army uh, following Pearl Harbor. He single-handedly held off a company of German soldiers for an hour uh, in France uh, despite being wounded and out of ammunition. So perfect fodder for a movie. Was he just reaching with a gun and going, bang, bang? <laughs> right. I'm gun. I got to watch the movie. I got to <laughs> figure out how he pulled it off. Uh, so he wrote the book in, in 1949, To Hell and Back, based on his experiences in the Army. And then he starred as himself in the 1955 uh, adaptation of the book and uh, it became the biggest hit in the history of Hollywood or uh, Universal Studios at the time uh, and he went on uh, to make a total of 40 movies and one TV series this is a guy who was only known because of his heroics in the war and then they said well come out to Hollywood and, oh. and he turned that into a film career and then on May 28 1971 he was killed when the private plane he was riding in as a passenger uh, crashed into the side of a mountain near Roanoke, Virginia, Damn, in please. rain, fog, zero visibility conditions. We did that episode. Well, yeah, and it was another case of the pilot not Jeez. being uh, instrument trained. He was flying visually and had zero visibility and hit a mountain. Uh, he was buried with uh, military honors at Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, he, despite getting the uh, Medal of Honor, they they say they usually put like gold leaf on the tombstone, and he said he didn't want that prior to dying. Uh, that he just wanted to be like every other soldier. Uh, they said his his uh, bur burial site is second most visited, only to JFK. Um, and so I'm mad at myself that we did two podcasts where I could have brought him up, and for some reason I overlooked it. But uh, now I'm making good on Audie <laughs> Murphy. So. Um, so that would have been perfect for our Hollywood at War episode. Uh, we followed that up with sex scandals. Always a fun one. Hot yeah. topic. Yeah. Fatty Arbuckle and stuff. Oh, there was no that. shortage of that one. That could have been an yeah. entire series. Uh, in July of this year, uh, this is one of my favorite episodes we did. Um, separating the art from the artist. Remember yep. that one? That was one of my favorite episodes that we did. That got, it, got into some really deep. Uh, conversation about when someone you admire, a musician, an actor, an athlete, when they do something wrong, do you still listen to their music, watch their movies, or do you? Uh... That was the Michael one. Yeah. <laughs> so that was that was a fascinating one, and that's you know that's still happening to this day. Yeah. You know, I, every time I see Alec Baldwin now, you know, like. I'll be scrolling on TikTok, and I get a lot of Saturday Night Live videos, and he had some great SNL videos. But now everything is tainted a little bit after what happened on the uh, Rust movie with the yeah. uh, accidental right. shooting. So, so yeah, that was a, a really interesting Imagine one. watching 30 Rock. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, he was great on that. And, yeah. and you go back earlier in his career, Beetlejuice and... Mm -hmm. Uh, one of my favorite horror movies, the the others. I think he was in the others, if I remember. The Hunt correctly. for Red October. Uh, and yeah, yeah, he he just had such a legendary uh, movie career, and now it's all tainted. Like, does that still kind of haunt you guys? Like, seeing celebrities that you once admired, like say a Kevin Spacey, and now you kind of cringe when you. I, I, I mean, I watch Naked Gun, and I see OJ, and I still laugh. Oh, my gosh. Because, but it's, yeah. I go in the back of my lap, I go, oh, wait. <laughs> I, I, for me, the Alec Baldwin thing is a little different because it, it was accidental. It wasn't like he pur purposely killed someone or raped somebody. Well, it was more incompetence. It was, in, it was, yeah. well, it was definitely onset incompetence. But he I, did. A couple things 
happened that shouldn't have happened. Incompetence in the fact that he did skirt the rule. I mean, people, yeah, there were yeah. regulations that people say you should follow him. He's like, eh, well, everyone else does it, so I don't have to. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, you know, there's always going to be that, you know, oh, I loved Alec Baldwin. And I said, yeah, but. And you know who, who has to live with that curse is Matthew Broderick. Uh, I don't know if we yeah. touched on him yeah, we did. Uh, on that episode, but he killed someone by visiting Europe and driving on the wrong side yep. of the road and killing someone. And he goes on about his life. I don't know if he ever faced any repercussions. And I no. just, within the last few days, I saw somebody post on Facebook, did you know Matthew Broderick killed somebody? So that's going to be hanging over his head the rest of his life. And most people are kind of shocked when they hear that. Like, what do you mean he killed somebody? Because that received zero, because it happened over there. And the yeah. immediate, the type, but at the time, it's not like he was a has been star. Him, he was dating Jennifer Grey. Yeah. You talk about the, you know, I mean, well, no, it's kind of weird. Yeah. His sister. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So after that episode, like, again, that was one of my favorites. That'd be like finding out Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher dated in Star Wars. I'm like, oh, okay, oh yeah. I can see it. Well, we didn't know at the time yeah. that they were siblings, but. Uh, we followed that episode up with Don't Touch That Dial, uh, TV-related uh, crimes and misdemeanors. And uh, we touched on, uh, oh, the, what's his the, name? The Beretta. quiz show. Uh, the quiz show scandals yeah. and uh, uh, Hogan's Hero, uh, Robert Crane yeah. murder and oh, stuff yeah. like that. That one was pretty interesting. Uh, we followed that up with some of our favorite film noir movies. Uh, I just have a passion for film noir. Uh, then uh, Jack the Ripper, which is a, a topic I'd always wanted to do a deep dive on. And, and our connection to Hollywood on that episode were uh, mostly films that were uh, that depict yep. Jack the Ripper crimes in those movies. So, uh, And then uh, locations, notorious locations, which was a fun one, uh, like Chateau Marmont where uh, Belushi died and stuff like that. Wheels of Terror, we talked about car crashes. Uh, our Halloween special, we talked about our favorite horror movies in October 23. Uh, our second most popular episode was a recent one in November, uh, the JFK episode, uh, which got 160 views on YouTube. I'm not sure how many on SoundCloud, uh, but that was an enormously popular one. And I remember when I uploaded that to YouTube, within a day or so, I noticed there were like 20 comments, which is unusual. And I'm like, oh, no. So I went in, opened up the comments, and started looking at them, and they were making me laugh out loud. People are so passionate about this conspiracy theory of, of uh, JFK being killed by, you know, multiple gunmen. And uh, around that time, because it was the anniversary of JFK, uh, there were a lot of documentaries and stuff. And since doing our podcast, I've watched a few more documentaries, newer ones, and, and one that was about a year or so old that uh, – Oliver Stone kind of revisited his JFK movie. And I got to say, after watching these documentaries, I'm starting to question the whole lone gunman thing. And I, when we did our podcast, I think I ended with, yeah, I'm pretty convinced it was Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, I mean, and we did the right thing. You take the, the accepted thing as Lee Harvey Oswald. Now convince me it's not. And it's fine because you have to have an anchor point reality. Right. You can't yeah. just, it can't be just be like Dorothy but, in the whirlwind. Yeah, and then you got to try to follow some sort of method of yeah. of rooting out speculation versus okay, this right. is what we know really happened. Yeah, there are certain concrete facts and say okay, now how how does this relate? Can you <clears throat> can you stack enough evidence? You can't just stack one or two points. Yeah, you, this thing will require a lot of peeling back, and you have to put you put the work in. And they're they're still doing it to this day. Yeah, Joe, how does that realization uh, make you now uh, think of the deep state? <laughs> well, it, it it a lot of people say that with the assassination of JFK, that the the office of the president is basically uh, smoke and mirrors. That the president doesn't have as much power as the American public seems to think they do, and that may have ended with JFK. Um, one documentary that I saw it was called "What the Doctors Saw." Did you hear about that? There's yes. a new one that was just came out no yeah. but i've heard of it's the seven parkland doctors yep yeah so yep. when when jfk arrived at parkland the surgeons and, and the staff that was there had dealt with this type of trauma their entire careers and what they saw and what they swear to today were entrance wounds in his throat and they in in his forehead they said there was a, a 
an entrance bullet wound in his forehead. The kill shot. Yeah. So they're like, we know what we saw. And the FBI and Secret Service was like, no, you're mistaken. And they're like, who are you to tell us <laughs> yeah. that we're mistaken? And then when they saw, like, autopsy photos and stuff later, they're like, that's not what we saw. We saw. And so I'm watching that, that these Parkland surgeons still, all these years later, and they're, stand and they're by still what sound mind and body. It'd be one thing, like, and then, and you're know, like, do you have an implant in your head? Like, what's going on? It's like, <laughs> I was in a car accident. So that, that documentary alone had me questioning things. But then I, I was really hesitant to watch that Oliver Stone documentary. And I think, I don't know if he produced it. I think he just kind of put his name on it and appeared in it. Um, but they looked at the how and, more importantly, why Kennedy was assassinated. And I got to say, after watching that, which I think it was called JFK Revisited or something yeah. like that, uh, after watching that, I'm like, oh, I may have been mistaken about this Lee Harvey Oswald thing. And I am I might be at the point where I'm starting to question whether – he even had a rifle in his hand at all that day yeah. after seeing these documentaries. Um, and, and, and some of the evidence that I point to was his reaction to the whole thing, like being encountered in the building by the police officer and not breathing heavy and not appearing nervous and, and going, I, what's going on? I don't know what's going on. And then at the police station going on, I'm a patsy. And he, he, when in one of these documentaries, they were talking to a journalist who was off camera while Oswald was sitting at a table being questioned by the media. And someone said something about being charged with the assassination at JFK. And he said, I have not been charged with that yet. And this journalist sitting behind the camera said, yes, you were, you were just charged today. And you see the look on Oswald's face like, Oh no. <laughs> like he's not that good of, I mean, he's not an actor. He's no. a human being. He's a person. And when you see his face, that he's been charged with the murder of JFK and you see his reaction. I'm like, his reaction seems very genuine. Like what is happening here? Um, so yeah, my those... fundamental thing was that everything has to be documented. And that's what was in those archives in Maryland. Yeah. That's the thing. All the, all the police reports, all the FBI reports, everything, all the invest interviews, and that's the stuff that never made it in the Warren commission. Yeah. When they did, it was like, that was the one that, yeah, that left a lot of stuff and out, they yeah. locked stuff away. After the, the the congressional report came in, that's the one that had the sixty or seventy year moratorium on it. And they were supposed to unlock it, and that's when yeah. I go that part because that's documented. That's not some crackpot on YouTube. It's oh, I remember because memories fade, right? Perceptions change, so that's why. Yeah, you know, you know. Yeah, one thing that haunts me watching that JFK revisited, and again, I would have to do more research to sure. find multiple sources. But one of the things they talked about that just eats at me is there's. There's talk that JFK was supposed to, within that year, was supposed to visit a city in Florida, and I think it was Chicago. Chicago. And both of those trips were canceled because there was intelligence that there was assassination plot. And they said in each of those cities, there were groups of gunmen that were spotted, and each city had a patsy. A guy with uh, a very similar background to Lee African Harvey Oswald, who served in the military um, and was sent to the Soviet Union for a brief period of time. And they all had similar backgrounds. Was and one so, of them African-American? No, uh, that, you, it might have been. I think, I think one, one of them might have been. Chicago. Been. Yeah. Been. And so, so when you hear that there were assassination plots in multiple cities and word got back to JFK's people and they were forced to cancel it, but then went ahead with the Dallas trip, and it played out exactly like they thought it might have played out in those other cities. I'm like, that's that's crazy, that's wild. So I mean, what never helped their entire cause was Alan Dulles being on the Dulles. war commission. I went, yeah. what a villain! Like that's another thing in these documentaries. He's a villain. He's yeah. an he's an evil evil person. And I mean, like, hey, they named an airport after him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, they named they named uh, a lot of about a lot of bad folk. I mean, the thing is, oh, people with questionable m morals. It's all it's I, like I think at the time we said it's when Dulles was put on the commission, that'd be like putting Steve Bannon or Rudy Giuliani on like yeah. the Truth Commission. I'm like what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, this is, it's a real commission. Giuliani's on it. Yeah. What could go wrong? And then the why of the JFK assassination? That to me, that was like the the convincer, like. 
the CIA. He wanted to disband the CIA. Because, um, yeah, they, they screwed up royally with the Bay of Pigs. Bay of Pigs. He and wanted to pull out of Vietnam. And what happened after he was gone, Johnson went in and escalated that, Vietnam. The very next year, you had the Gulf yep. of Tonkin incident. Well, not e- this is what's crazy about the documentary. The day of Kennedy's funeral, uh, Kennedy had uh, typed up a, a memo that was supposed to go out about de-escalating Vietnam. The day of the funeral, Johnson got a hold of that memo and made changes to it to escalate. The day of the funeral. Wow. So there's talk that Johnson, I, I, the one woman that I talked to and when I was in Dallas called Johnson the head of the snake of this conspiracy. And there's a lot of evidence out there that has has me rethinking the I mean, entire thing. He was Possible. out of power by then, but General Eisenhower kind of supported Kennedy saying, yeah, if you're going to get out of it, don't go in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm a I'm a changed man after our JFK podcast, and I, I kind of wish I would have seen those documentaries before we we did our podcast because they were eye opening. At the so. very least, it says you should do more research. You know, you can't say other you can't say for 100 percent sure. It's, yeah. it, all that we know is that we have reasonable doubt. Yeah, that's the whole point. Can, can you accept the truth as Lee Harvey Oswald shot President Kennedy? Yeah, that's where this is. Can all of you? introduced with evidence credible evidence reasonable doubt to the rest of us yeah and that's where i that's how i approached it now one of the comments that was posted on our youtube video that almost made me laugh out loud and i did look into it i I researched it just to see if there's anything to it but there's apparently a theory out there that a secret service man in a car behind kennedy's limo accidentally fired the kill shot (laughs) and i'm like okay come on this sounds too ludicrous to to ignore and what convinced these people was like a single photo there's a there's a press pool photo immediately after the first shot was fired where you see secret service looking back toward the school book depository and one of the secret service has like an ar-15 in his hand and people saw that and said there's your your murder weapon right there and I said, okay, I'm at least going to look into this. And there's no credibility to okay. that. Think about all the witnesses that were there in Dealey Plaza. Do you think none of them saw an AR-15 go off and hit Kennedy in the back of the head? Were <laughs> any of the comments personal? Did anyone say, like, why is there a bear on your podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no, they were just like, you know, uh, I think they were directed at me saying, uh, he's perpetuating this myth that it was a lone gunman and, and now, like I said, I'm starting to s- kind of see things their way. But, but yeah, that one, that one uh, conspiracy theory about the Secret Service guy was ridiculous. And, and they said, they said well, th- what happened was, what had happened was um, <laughs> that as the motorcade started to accelerate, the Secret Service guy was kind of thrown back and, and pulled the trigger because I guess his finger was on the trigger. But when you, when you watch the, the Zapruder film and stuff like that, the motorcade actually slowed down during the kill shot, and it was only after the, the kill shot where it accelerated right. and sped off. So the theory and that— Why would a Secret was, Service man have a safety off gun? gun finger on the uh, trigger, finger on the trigger aimed at like the that. president. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that theory is bunk. Yeah. Well, um, you know, if Lee Harvey doesn't work, Frank will work. I saw <laughs> Frank do it. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, and I guess apparently, too, there's been uh, some evidence that the that magic bullet, that pristine bullet that we were talking about, that a Secret Service agent had come forward saying he's the one who had found it. I don't know if we talked about this on we the did. podcast. And that he had set it down, and somebody picked it up and claimed it was the bullet that had hit both of them or whatever. But supposedly the first person who had found it was supposed to etch their initials in it and— Later on, the, like the bullet that was photographed, like those initials are missing. So it was the chain of custody this, problem. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, we did talk about yeah, that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's another thing that just kind of just mucked up the whole works. Is this pristine because that's bullet. documented? That's yeah. not someone here. That's officially entered in there, and they're supposed. And they even said the people that were disputing said, "Well, then where's where's the etch mark?" Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so that again, that was one of my favorite podcasts and yeah, uh, one of our more popular podcasts. And and obviously, we could probably do a part two if we wanted to. We but. never did Hollywood and Aliens. Alien, <laughs> <laughs> Alien conspiracy. Like Are you talking about Mexicans? Yeah. No, uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I always wondered about that. I was, uh, I always say like you know an alien abducted me and like there's a, but I'm like but is there is that a crime? 
Is that a yeah. crime? We can't, I don't know if that's in our jurisdiction. It depends uh, if they get into the probing. That could be assault, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, would that be L- L.A. City PD or L.A. County <laughs> yeah. PD? Yeah. See, or would that be state that's of California? Yeah. Yeah. It was a jurisdictional thing for yeah. us. That's yeah. why we couldn't really. Well, that's why they formed Space Force for there that you go. specific <laughs> reason. Yeah. I know this is getting a little off topic, but I cover a lot of you know military ceremonies here in Lake Orion. And... Uh, and when they acknowledge each branch of the military, there's always someone when they they go Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, there's always someone who yells out Space Force. <laughs> and they go, oh, yeah, Space Force. <laughs> uh, man. And you know the funny part? That that used to be the Coast Guard reaction. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Now Space right. Force gets it. But watch Space Force. Yeah. They're going to get the fun. Coast Guard because- is finally like. Finally, we get to be with yeah. the other big yeah, they're, boys. Yeah, they're laughing with yeah. the other guys going, look space at those Space, space Force guys. Force, but Space Force is like, yeah, we're going to get the money. Watch <laughs> it. We're going to be in space. Oh, man. All right. So that, uh, oh, and then our last uh, one we did before this was uh, was plane crashes. And, yep. Uh, we talked about that. So um, what have we left off? Is, is there anything we didn't get around to, you know, a... Uh, well, I mean, it's almost impossible. Well, look at it this way. We have to cover interesting topics. There's day-to-day crime in Hollywood that's going on that it's misdemeanor, basic felony stuff. But the stuff that's really interesting, that's worth a podcast and diving into, I feel like we touched on a lot, all the big ones. Mm-hmm. And they're, and it's almost impossible for us to cover every single topic. I mean, we'd really have to you know, go digging and digging and digging. But at that point, you, you figure, you know, what... No- like what kind of nuggets are we going to find? I think we we touched on all the major ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, before we yeah, get any executive notes and studio notes about <laughs> like uh, I think you need to have a uh, you know recast the the lead. <laughs> you know, we get notes from we don't we haven't got any suit notes. So we're we're ending, <laughs> we're ending on a high note, you know. <laughs> well, you know, originally that when we started this, I wanted to focus on like golden age crimes yeah. because anyone involved with that are no longer around anymore. Um, but then as we continued, we started getting into some of the more modern stuff and, um, and, uh, Robert Blake, you know, stuff like that. OJ Simpson, more recent stuff. And, um, but yeah, I, I feel like, you know, is is there's always been a fascination with this. There's a true crime podcast faction out there and hopefully there are people out there who looking for something interesting to listen to in their, their commute. Uh, hopefully they stumbled onto our podcast and got I, some I had a friend, out of it. I, had, I have a friend's younger sibling who uh, basically said, Golden Age, you're talking like the 80s and 90s? And I, it kind of <laughs> hit me. I went, oh, okay, for us, the Golden Age is the beginning in the yeah. 20s, 30s, and 40s. I'm like, okay, you know, you should be whooped for that, but I, 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 you know, I, I get it. I get I'm at it. the age when someone says 20 years ago, I go, the 80s? And they're like, no, 2000. I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> the 2000 was 20 years ago? <laughs> 23 yeah, they, i mean because they look at they look at 2002 and they're like that was like pre-youtube twitter yeah. pre cell phones and sending yeah. stuff like what'd you guys do i bought my first pc in 2000 yeah it's weird to think that i did not own a computer prior to the year 2000 that was novel that was new yeah because that just wasn't our thing yeah yeah so um now even though we're kind of wrapping up Hollywood crime scene, uh, we will return in January under a, a different title, different topic. Uh, we will keep uh, Hollywood in the title because that's kind of our yeah. thing. Um, but over the course of this podcast, we, we tried to connect a lot of these to movies and films and things like that. And we, we share a common interest in that. So we're going to move forward with a new podcast called Hollywood Blockbusters. And we're going to focus on films, and we'll yeah. we'll kick off uh, in January with our new podcast by looking back at 2023 and looking ahead at the most anticipated films of 2024. And and, and Joe Joe got a new hat for the new uh, yes for the new show. Rock a new hat, Hollywood. That's a wardrobe wardrobe change. They, they wardrobe right. we, there's some notes we have to it's, take from the studio. It's a tax write off. <laughs> yeah. They write it off. Also, another reason why we did this because. You didn't want to try to sh- – there are tons of interesting topics. Andrew was, uh, came with several of them, including music, where you don't want to shoehorn a crime into it. it was like, was right. there a crime involved? Because we are a Hollywood crime scene. We could get Hollywood and the scene. <laughs> right. It was all like, is it a crime, though? Yeah, and right. yeah, some of the topics we touched on were borderline. Yeah. I mean, I, I figured anything you might put caution tape around, we'll call that a crime scene. Mm-hmm. I mean, so. there's something to say, like, them winning the Oscar, that was a crime right there. I'm like, oh, so, <laughs> yeah, we're getting away from the literal sense and more to the <laughs> implication and metaphor. Fair enough. Yeah. 
So um, I don't know about you guys, but 2023 for me was one of the weakest years in movies, probably uh, compared even compared to the COVID year. Um, there was not a lot of stuff that came out in 2023 that if I you, had any interest in. If you look up uh, the top movies of 2023 on Rotten Tomatoes or Collider, the first 10 I go, I didn't even see. Did those even come out? I didn't even know yeah. about those. I mean, look, they they could be dramatic, independent art dramas, but mm-hmm. yeah, I have to know they came out so I can know which theater to go see them in, even if they're only for limited seeing. Yeah, there there were a lot that I hadn't even heard of on yeah. a yeah. lot of people's top top lists. Yeah. Prior to COVID, uh, I would go to the movie theater twenty times, twenty five times. Exactly, me too. And I knew people who would go more than that. I I, I know one guy who pretty much goes every weekend. Um, since COVID, I probably average about five movies a year in the theater now. And, uh, this past year, it might, might've been a little more than that, but there's only one movie from this past year that I saw in the theater that I thought, okay, that was really, really entertaining. And that was John Wick four. And uh, again, we'll talk more about this in January, but it's crazy to think that my favorite movie for 2023 was John Wick four. One movie that I walked out of, which would surprise a lot of people, was The Fablemans. I went to the theater. I was excited to see this new Steven Spielberg movie. And The Fablemans was not what I was, what I had signed up for. And about halfway through the movie, I, I checked out. I got up, walked out like a casino dealer changing. Um, what well, specifically turned you I, off? I, Steven Spielberg is my all-time favorite director. I consider him one of the greatest directors of all time. And I was looking forward to seeing a movie that gave me some insight as to why he was the greatest director. And what I got instead was a f- dysfunctional family drama about a mother who may or may not have been nuts uh, and, uh, you know, anti-Semitism and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, this, this isn't what I was hoping for. And I just felt like it didn't really give me any insight. Um, I got up, walked out and within a day or so, I found the Steven Spielberg documentary on HBO max. And I sat down and watched that. And it was like cleansing your palate, like that documentary looking into his youth, which Ironically, this documentary validated a lot of stuff that was in that movie. A lot of the stuff in the movie, even though it was about a fictional family, was almost shot for shot, scene for scene in this documentary. I don't know why they call it the Fablemans. It should have been called the Spielbergs. Um, But the documentary gave me more insight as to why Spielberg became Spielberg. So so Fablemans was one of my uh, most disappointing movies. It was marketed as why Spielberg loved filmmaking how he a love, yeah. almost like a love note to why he, what inspired him to go into it and I, I never saw the movie but that's yeah. what the trailers conveyed but hearing that yeah i'd rather watch the documentary yeah so would i yeah i i recommend it uh we got a little over five minutes favorite and least favorite movie of 2023 i don't have a least favorite because i didn't go to the theater that much but what i did see recently and it, and it became my top movie godzilla minus one Oh. That's on my to-do list. Uh, people are raving about it. They're calling it a masterpiece. I mean, oh, yeah, look, I don't want to overhype it, but it. I tried to minimize the hype. I walked into it because I love Godzilla. That's mm-hmm. my hype. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. And I watched, uh, that was the first movie that I ever cared about the human characters, and they did a great job. I wouldn't be surprised if the protagonist, and I, God uh, help me, I can't remember the actor's name, but if he does not get an Oscar nomination, hmm. I would be surprised. Wow. He he sold the damage that he he experienced. Yeah, I great uh, job in it. I don't know if you guys can relate to this, but when I was a kid, I would come home from school, and I think it was Channel Seven had the four o'clock movie, and a lot of times they would do theme weeks. There was Elvis week, there was Planet of the Apes week, and there was Godzilla week or Monster week. And I grew up watching these Godzilla movies on TV, so I am looking forward to it. I'm hoping to see it before we kick off our new podcast in January. If you and, can see it in that uh, Atlas sound or, or Atlas yeah. Dolby sound, because that's that's that I saw it and that really. It brings it to it add the sound element adds to it. Is it, is it Japanese with subtitles? Yeah, with English okay. subtitles. That, I mean, I I I, could, I need to watch it in, with with the subtitles. And yeah, I don't want to do the dubbing thing because I've had bad experiences with dubbing. <laughs> yeah, it gives it a whole different experience. Subtitles versus dubbing. Um, take the movie Life Is Beautiful. You know, when when I saw Life Is Beautiful in theater, I in the theater I I saw it with subtitles. And I, 
I cried and I was emotional. I thought it was amazing. And then when it came to cable and video, I tried watching it dubbed, and it was a different movie with, it, with the dubbing. Yeah, because yeah. they can't convey the same action in the studio when they're exactly. doing a live performance. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, you have a favorite and least favorite of 2023? I'm, I'm kind of like uh, Nick in that I don't – it's hard for me to pick, like, a least favorite. I didn't see anything that I hated. Hmm. It's not like a couple years ago when I saw Gemini Man in the theater with Will Smith, and I was oh. like, I yeah. just wasted twelve dollars. <laughs> um, but favorite, I, I might have to go with Oppenheimer. Yeah, I I absolutely loved it. I I understand how people can say it's a little talky, it's long, it's three hours long, mm -hmm. but I did see it with two work friends and a completely packed out theater, so that helped. That helped the mood, and yeah. everyone was like. <gasps> When they, none when of they, a, none when of they us, finally detonated the bomb, yeah, yeah, and and it was it was a, an experience, and I'm glad I saw it in the theater. None of us said Barbie. Well, I did see Barbie, and I I would put it in my top five. Um, I liked it. I didn't love it, and I can say that about a lot of movies that have come out over the past year or two. Uh, that there were a lot of movies where I was like, eh, I liked it. Um, but I just wasn't passionate about the the last movie that I feel like I was really passionate about, really loved was uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and that wow, came that's out been, like four years. I was going to say, it's been four years, So in Joe. four years, <laughs> a guy who loves movies has not seen a movie that I'm passionate about in four years. Um, I, I saw Barbie. I liked it. Um, my sisters and, and other females that I'm close to, they all got together and saw it, and they said they wept during the movie. Wow. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, so I, I enjoyed it. I just didn't love it. I'm not adding it to my DVD Blu-ray collection. Um, I did buy John Wick 4, and that's probably probably the first Blu-ray I've bought in a while uh, to add to my collection. I still, I still need to see that. I didn't see what John hurt. Wick. What hurts the most is I'd rather have movies that I hate because then at least there's some passion behind yeah. it. I was, I'm, They're memorable. At I'm least. angry that yeah. I'm disappointed in 2023 that nothing yeah. really came out. I mean, I saw Bullet Train when I because now I'm trying to think about it, but that came out strictly on Netflix. Yeah, that didn't come out in the theaters. I think. Oh, okay. Did it? It, I don't know. Maybe it did, but you know, I didn't get the chance to see it in theater. Was that with Brad Pitt? Brad Pitt. I yeah. think it briefly. Yeah. Maybe oh yeah, had, it did. It might have had like three, two yeah. or three weeks in the theater. Yeah. But there you go. There lies the thing with with 2023. There's. Yeah. Yeah, I. I I love the Fast and Furious movies, and I saw Fast X, and I was like, eh. And here's the weird thing. I just sat down to watch Mission, Mission Impossible, the new Mission Impossible, and it is Fast X all over again. Is it? They're shot in same locations, same <laughs> improbable stunts. I, you know, I did there see that There are a lot one. of similarities one. there. So It was entertaining. At least I'll, I'll tell you that. Tom never puts out a movie that's not entertaining yeah. in the Mission Impossible series. A Haunting in Venice. That I, that I I had a chance to see that in theater. Hmm. I enjoyed that one. Okay, that's okay. been a surprising trilogy that about. doesn't get a lot of pub with Kenneth Branagh playing right. uh, Hercule Poirot. Yeah, uh, there are just movies I have zero interest in, like Willy Wonka. Oh, yeah. uh, I just I have trailers to. just I, don't look. I have good to go see it. I, I, even if it's, I know I might be walking up the cliff, but I'll I'll do it for the team. I'll take that one for the I team. We'll expect your. I heard it's all right. Yeah, I just. Oh, did you see it? I know. I I heard it's okay. It's I, right. I love the original so much with with Gene Wilder. That, oh yeah. Uh, you know, I I never saw the the Johnny Depp version, and and the trailers for this one to me look. Even so though the awful. Johnny Depp version is more closely adapted to the book, uh, from what from what I can tell, the Gene Wilder performance was great. Uh, yes. Because you grow up with that one. Yep. Yeah. All right. So there's a little sneak peek of what you could expect come January when we launch Hollywood blockbusters. We'll probably recap a lot of stuff we just talked about. Uh, but that brings Hollywood crime scene to a close. Who knows? Maybe someday we might have a reason to get together and talk about. Yeah, if crime uh, shoots crimes. back up again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's no end to that. So uh, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed Hollywood crime scene. And like I said, all of our episodes are on YouTube and SoundCloud. So you can go back and find them. And we'll see you in January. Thank Happy you for listening. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year.